delighted to introduce our next video, which is a recorded conversation which was done yesterday uh, by the incredibly talented and generous artist Marina Abramovich. Uh, and the subject is going to be the legacy of performance. Enjoy. Marina, I can't believe it's your birthday today. Happy birthday. And by the time people listen to this, you'll be one day older than you are today, which is 76. Um, well, I want to go back to when you were a, a, a young girl. Uh, the whole conversation is going to be about legacy and how we how artists um, conserve and document their own careers. But when did you realise as a young woman or as a girl that being an artist was something that you might be able to do? I just wanted to say something before this question. I will answer this question is that I don't think any better day than my birthday to talk about legacy is today, because every time <laughs> I get a birthday, you know, starting from 60, 61, two, three, five, so on, 70, it was a big turn on. And really thinking about legacy and testament it, it instantly, the birthday is a time that you think about legacy and testament. This is why I think this conversation for me had much more deeper meaning than any other day. And uh, so we will later on more discuss about that. But I think that as, as a very young child, as my mother was this director of the Museum of Art and Revolution, I had this, I see her collecting everything because being the communism, every piece of letter, every kind of little sketch, everything can be actually also evidence, you know, for whatever in, in communist country. So as, as, and then also, you know, she was, the, the person who always follow instructions. She write me instructions, what to do, how many the the the, the words of French I have to learn per day, what, what is my my task of the day. And I will collect these instructions. So would I think also all the letters that everybody write to me, I will never throw them away. So I actually from very young childhood have this archive. I was always archiving something. I never saw anything away because somehow I had the kind of feeling, I don't know why, it would be kind of historical document at some point, sometime, someday. And it will take me 50 years to realize that actually it is. That's really interesting because we could, therefore, if we were doing some bad psychoanalysis, say that when you became a performance artist in your early 20s at art school, because you'd grown up in a culture and in a household where you collected so much, that performance art was a reaction against that because it's ephemeral, because it only exists in the moment. Is that is that a fair observation or too reductive? No, no, it's totally right. But at the same time, when I started doing performance art, there was a very big kind of the idea in, in, with me that we should that there should not make any document. There should not be photographed. There should not be video. Any kind of document because the performance is time-based art, it should be just in the memory of the of the person who see it. And and then and that kind of memory could be narrated, you know, to another and, and another another person, but never really physically existing. But then this was very short-lived this whole idea. And, and I started thinking that it was very important to document all the performances. And somehow in that time, you know, only photograph material was black and white photographs. Later on, it was Super 8. Then after Super 8, it became the, the, the video. And then a very also early stage, I realized that I have to give very precise instructions to all the people who are recording. And it's as important the concept, as important is how it's going to be recorded. That actually transporting this idea in a, a foot to the audience who are not there in, in the future. So that kind of notion was very kind of clear to me from right from the beginning. And they start actually with one very, very funny event, uh, as, uh, especially not with photographic work so much, but with video. When video was invented, this was like a, like a, a miracle. Oh my God, I can do the video. And I was in Denmark at that time. And they told me that my performance can be, can be immediately recorded. And uh, so I never give any structure to the to the person recording it. And I was doing this piece to call Art Must Be Beautiful, Art Must Be Beautiful. And and I was thinking that he would record my head because this is the performance about head. And you when I saw the not the coming the head, when I saw the performance, the, the recording after the live performance, I was I was terrified. I was in total shock because this guy was using every possibility of the video camera I can do, you know, like a kind of solarization, going left and right, filming my legs when I was doing my head, you know, absolutely unusable material. After this, I say to him, as when I 
material, please can you press only one button, delete, and we delete entire material. Then I say to him, I'm going to have the camera as my public. We position the camera only, you know, focusing on my head. And I want you to press the button and go and smoke a cigarette, which he did. He went to the smoke a cigarette. I record the entire performance. And now we have really video who actually presented the work. And this was very, you know, important learning lesson about documents. So you, the person filming was wanted to be creative, wanted to be artistic, whereas you wanted a neutral documentation of the performance on video. Um, so that the idea that the video transformed what was otherwise just done in static photography is, is obviously very interesting. But you also, from those early performances in the, in the, from around 1974, the rhythm series, you often kept the implements. I mean, I think the most famous and notorious um, is Rhythm Zero that was done in Naples, where 72 objects were selected by you, everything from a rose, a feather, to a knife, a pair of scissors, a gun, and one bullet. And you were in the gallery for six hours, and the audience could do to you what they wanted. And those objects still remain. The Tate have that table of objects. Um, when you began to devise that piece, did you think in terms of how it would be recorded or was it still something that you were going to be because there's no filming of that there's no filming of that did you think about how it might be documented or was it something that was much more confrontational between you and the audience and that came afterwards about what you did with the objects so first of all i have to correct the object the state have they're not they're not original objects because original objects i throw them away immediately after being used i didn't want to have that kind of objects i didn't want to have that kind of the, the like chris burden he will save the golden nails when he done this work transfixed on volkswagen you know crucifixion and he is he, he kept them as many people kept the objects so gina pa was famous for that i didn't want any of these objects i find like a kind of, kind of wrong sentiment and the kind of nostalgic idea and it was not what is about the object, it's about the content of the work. So I dismissed all of the objects. I remember the gallery kept a few of them and they claiming they were original objects. I sent a very angry letter that this I not recognized as a part of the work and they have to throw these objects away. So that every time you know, I, if I, if I want to you know, show the, 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 the artist, the, the, the Rhythm Zero, I would just go and buy objects, exactly 76 objects that I use, you can buy them today. And uh, then I put them on the table, and that's it. So we, this sentiment is out of this object, you know, kind of related to you know, the three. So, sorry, so, so the Tate's, the Tate's construct is a reconstruction of objects that you have acquired subsequently. So they're authenticated by you, but they aren't the original objects, but they're replicas of, or at least they're, they're the similar objects to the 72 that were there originally. Absolutely right. And then as the performance was done in Italy, I will use Italian newspaper, I will use Italian olive oil, I will, you know, use the, the, the object, you know, just based the, from the you know place that was the performance made. But the objects are absolutely new and bought for the occasion. Of course, the piece itself. Are you surprised, you surprised about that? No, do you know, I didn't realize, no, I'm so gullible. I, when I've seen it shown at the Tate as a documentation of the performance, I just, as a matter of trust, and I don't think the Tate had deceived me, I probably didn't re read the label close enough, but I just presumed they were the original objects. Because I've always thought with your work, you either, um, it's film footage, it's, it's film photographic stills, or there are some objects that remain. But the key thing about that particular performance, as with all your performances, is, what you can control which is the time and the uh, of ob the objects laid out but you can't control what the audience do nor can you recreate that nor can you document it retrospectively so what happened let's just go through what actually happened in that space first of all again before i answer this i have something else to tell you about objects you know i only kept two objects in my life the important to me. And this was a, from my walk in the Great Wall of China, which public was not present. I kept my shoes that, that I walked for 2,500 kilometers, and the shoes completely sore, was almost gone. And I kept the stick, wooden stick, that I actually cut myself and made it when I started the walk. And this wooden stick is 15 centimeters shorter. So there are two objects that I, I not only that I kept them, but I reused them. 
in different performances. And you lose the same shoes, the same stick in performance, you know, the, the Thomas slips in Guggenheim in the, you know, the, 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 the seven easy pieces which I made. I, I also use this, um, this the shoes and the stick in House with Ocean View. And I kind of choose as, as you appear, I actually wear them, you know, and that kind of object was like a part of my daily life. So the transit from the just objects and performance into daily life, it's kind of interesting. And okay, go back to the Rit of Zero. Rit of Zero it came out of really anger how was perceived performance at the time. You know, I was 23 years old and everybody was, you know, condemning the performance. Like there was no any kind of art. It's Gansakis to said this is the it's just bullshit. There to be uh, people who put in mental hospital, but they do this stuff. So I was thinking, okay, what if I do absolutely in nothing? I'm standing in the space with objects for pleasure and for torture, including pistol. And make it a statement. Yes, you can use everything on me. And I, and if you you know if you wanted to kill me, you could kill me because I speak with the bullet. And to see what public want to do. And I'm totally passive. And the public, you know, it was really the key of the piece was the timing because six hours of time was very important that the public kind of liberate themselves in the space and become more and more um, free. At the beginning, they would give me the rose, in the beginning, they would give me, uh, you know, they, 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 they would give me grape to eat or, or whatever. And later on, they start to use much harder objects. The interesting thing about this all, all piece was that, that the projection it was Italian audience in April who came, you know, with the normal opening with his house, with, with the wives. And uh, you know, just people from from the gallery scene. And so interesting was that that the, what they was projecting on me by using objects was projecting three actually the the, the, the things from the, the Italian the the, the the society. It was presenting Mad mother, Madonna, and the home. Three images you could see it in all this you know the the, the intervention they've been doing on me. They will give me the rose, but they will cut my clothes and they will take in the rose and stuff in my in my body, like you know, like it's suffering Jesus. And then they will, you know, they will just put the cotton around my neck and try to light the fire. They will sit me on the chair and I put the water to drink on my head, in really cold water, or they will move me around in a car, you know, half naked, put me on the table, spread my legs and stop the night between. So all of this, this I was totally passive, looking just in one one point and that, and that just kind of fix always in one point. And it was interesting that women will not do anything to me, but they will always take tears out of my eyes because I was, I was those tears were coming from the, all these activities. And, uh, and they, they would tell men what to do to me. Uh, and you know, the one reason I was not raped, which was the situation that, that, that was, you know, that, was, that came with their wives. I don't know what would happen. But then somebody put the bullet in the pistol, put in my hand, Somebody take the the, the the pistol away, throw out to the window, and it was it was you know going on and on and on. And after six hours, the guards come and say to me, six hours is over, which was two two in the night, two o'clock in the night. And I start walking towards them, and I was you know full of blood and tears and looking like hell. And the whole public literally ran away, everybody, every single person. I came to the hotel, I found the piece of gray hair in my. Uh, literally on my head was very hair. And I knew that moment that really public can kill you. If you give the opportunity, they can kill you. And that was a really big, big uh, kind of le lesson I learned. And then next day, everybody was calling the gallery to, to apologize. They still didn't know why they're doing it and all that. But this was experiment, you know. The thing was really to see what is the actual role of the public and how far public can go if you're totally nationalist. You know, I was 23, that's, that's important. I risk everything then. No, it's, it's traumatic hearing it again, and it must have been terribly traumatic going through it. And I know that all your performances at that time, you were pushing at, you know, what, where the body, what the body could do, the endurance of the body and, and, and pain. But you, you re-performed certain works. Did you ever re-perform Rhythm 10? You know, I made the written attempt twice, one with 10 knives and one with 20 knives. This was one thing. I reperformed the uh, Lips of Thomas, uh, but the Lips of Thomas I made originally one hour. I performed for seven hours in Guggenheim. I just add time to the pieces. But, but Rhythm but rhythm Zero, sorry, Rhythm Zero, you never did that piece again. That was only performed once. 
I actually, when I su uh, submitted my proposal for for the Guggenheim for seven easy pieces, I wanted to reperform the rhythm zero, and I could not get any lawyer permission in the entire United States. <laughs> so. Sorry. So I thought you didn't perform it because it was so traumatic and that you would expose yourself potentially to, 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 to danger, but it, it, it was the lawyers wouldn't let you 20 years later. Well, there, there was no... I've lost you, Marina. I can't hear you now. I, I remember a long time ago, I received the documentation of young artists from Hong Kong who reperformed Rhythm Zero instead of pistol, he had banana. <laughs> now, you mentioned seven easy pieces, and that's a, a nice moment to, to, to leap forward. Uh, there's other questions I want to ask you about your performance work and, and the specific legacies of certain pieces. But in, in 2005, um, at the Guggenheim, you perform what's now a landmark exhibition, certainly as far as the legacy of performance art goes, because you persuaded five major performance artists to let you re-perform their pieces alongside one of your own works for seven nights, and then the, the fight, and, and then you also performed uh, your your own work too. Um, let's just talk about the motivation for that. Was that all about legacy? In other words, you wanted to be able to uh, open the possibilities that other people's art could be reperformed in the future, but also your own. Was that why you did it? So, absolutely yes. I was at that time exactly sixty years old, and looking back, it was such a massive performance world. There was no legacy. There was not any kind of control on the, the original pieces not original pieces. You know, there were so many young artists who actually copy the, 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 the historical pieces and young curator who doesn't know the history who praise this artist like the events that we knew, which, which me, for my generation, you know, is absolutely not true. So there was also MTV, there was also the, the fashion, there was also the, the theater, the cinema. Everybody was taking parts of the performances and kind of reorganizing in their own structure. And there was no any rights. I mean, if you take the piece of music and uh, and uh, you make you take piece of Bach music, but you make techno Bach, you still have to pay the rights for that. You know, the own version you're making. Here was no any kind of rule in that. And when we 60 at that time, and, and also so many artists of my generation, they, you know, like Vito Conti was doing architecture, the same with Dennis Oppenheim, the his brother was doing something else. There was no actually continuation performance and these people didn't really take their legacy at the time but as them the one of the few continue to make some order in this thing i actually to google and I, it took me 12 full years that I actually accepted to actually do the seven easy pieces and the idea for me the concept was very clear i have to ask a living artist for permission understand what was the work and then, you know, and then make your own version. But when you show your own version, you always have to refer to the original work. So I, the artists I ask, the, ex, the everybody say yes, except Gina Pane, who's a foundation that I have to ask because she was not leaving. And then in the case of his birth, and I want to do transfers with Volkswagen piece, he never answered the question, never say yes, never say no. And the one day when I ask him, but why you have this kind of attitude? I said, but I, who cares? You know, if you want to do it, just do it. But he didn't really give me an official answer, and I didn't want to accept that. So I asked them the widow of the, of, um, um, the Joseph Boys to give me permission, which she did pay for the permission to, to the foundation of the artist himself. And then, which is really very important, is that, that when you see the work, uh, which I'm adding to this work, the new thing, all the work, it doesn't matter how long they've been performed originally, I add them time. Not one work was performed, you know, the seven hours. All these works are performed seven hours, no matter what. So my uh, contribution was not making techno Bach, but giving the time to the performance. So, you know, like Gina Pane piece with the bad candle bed, it was part of bigger work, but they only gave me that piece to perform. This was only a light. That piece was, she performed 23 minutes. I performed seven hours. 
And how long did you perform? The, and the same with the Joseph Boyce, the um, How to Explain Paintings to a Dead Hair. That was seven minutes. The, the Vito Acconci seedbed, where Vito Acconci famously was under the floorboards of the gallery, masturbating as the viewers came in. You did the same thing, but as a woman, under the floorboards for seven hours. Absolutely, yes. You know, with the, with the Joseph Boyce was so interesting. The, the Guggenheim Museum was sending her emails over and over, you know, for permission, and she's always denied. So I one, one February, I took my suitcase and I went to this other, it was snowing and cold, and I knock on the door, unannounced. She opened the door, she said, Frau Abramovich, my answer is no, but you can have coffee. And I said, can I have a tea? Five hours later, I had permission because I actually explained to her why it's so important. And this is really important because in that time, the, the Ava boys had more than 45 law cases because of the problems of legacy on her side. Because what happened at that time, boys during his life, he didn't actually um, instruct any of the photographers who done their work. And uh, when he, he do the performance, there will be made four or five photographers. And then after they would show him the work and he would choose maybe one or three images that he think that was causes to present his work. Like in the case of, of, the, of the piece the, that I was performing, it's the only one image actually. But these photographers, after boy's death, start making the, 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 the additions of the images they had and they start selling it as their own work because they photograph. So there's a mess, you know, this is why this legacy is so important and clarity and how you actually have to own the, the literally original photographic material that nobody can use it. So you've also now, you're training people and, 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 and enabling people to re-perform some of your performances, but you're a very famous and important performance artist. So when I see a Marina Abramovich re-performance of a Vito Acconci piece or a Bruce Nauman piece, it still feels authored by you. Whereas when I see two trained performance artists doing a Marina Abramovich piece, I'm still thinking it's a Marina Abramovich piece. So let's just unpack that a bit. How much when you, let's just go back to, when you were re-performing Bruce Nauman or Valley Export or Gina Payne, how much did you feel absolutely immersed in their work? And how much did you feel you were acting out something that they'd done before? It's such an incredible, crucial question. It takes so much time. I think it's so important to discuss this. You know, first of all, you know, the, as I said, which I add there is the timing. Timing is something that, that is my thing. You know, I, I find out the long duration of performances are the one who actually can really change you physically, mentally, spiritually, in many ways. But not just you, but also the public listening and, and viewing and being participating in the work. And everything would go over two or three hours. You actually, it's, it's not telling you pretending, it's not really acting. You, true, you actually show your vulnerability and true self which is totally something else. So this is what I've done. I, I absolutely study the work. Let's say Joseph Boys. The Ava Boys gave me very important document that I, nobody ever saw. 45 minutes of the German television filming this entire thing because performance was 45 minutes. And it was incredible the comments on television show. That's why she never showed. It was like everybody was loving how ridiculous is this whole thing and how absolutely bullshit is. So, and then with such important performance. And you choose just one image him with, with the hair, with the golden face, and becomes something iconic. And, uh, and so on the basis of that reconstruction of that bad TV program, I create a piece which start to stay seven hours. And uh, then, you know, it's the, the thing with the, with the performance, I, let's, let's put my, my, me on the side. Let's just take, let's example, Tino Segal. Tino Segal made this piece, Kiss, which he make additional. He's the first art artist who actually have the genius idea to sell the work in performance work, which nobody of us ever think of it. And uh, he actually sold, I think it was additional five. So the museum was bought. And that kiss can be performed by the two performer. I saw this kid kiss perform in many museums. I saw this kiss incredibly great and very, very bad. So it's all about charisma of the performer himself. So this is so essential, the training of the people going to perform the piece. And this is why I have institute, that's why I have the soul now, the, the set up the, the kind of um, structure to do that. Because the same, you can have lousy Bach again performed and you can have incredible 
the, the guy who, who really brings something of himself to perform Bach or Beethoven or whatever. It is the same with performance. If the performer is not charismatic, you just have bad work. So that's the essential who is able to perform in the best possible way it is. And that's the, really another problem with the legacy. Because if I introduce the re-performance, which actually I was the first one, and everybody was against it, I have to be also responsible that it's done well, that we have a very strong string, the, 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 the principle conditions how it should be done. So, so how do you ensure in the future, when you're no longer alive, that your performances can be performed to the standards that you want? Obviously, it's a, it's a leap of faith. And, and you tr you're talking about training performers. But how do you work out, I mean, how do you stipulate the right levels of charisma? I mean, OK, that's a slightly pure question. But what, what physical instructions are you giving for, for the re-performance of works that will ensure a certain standard or level? What I if to tell you what happened, you know, I just had the exhibition, The Cleaner, who actually traveled in seven museums in, in Europe. And uh, in these seven museums, they performed some of my pieces. And I had a very dedicated, more than 45 young performer who actually would love to re-perform this piece during the show, which is crazy. So these people literally performed for three years the, my work. And some of them, they are amazing and some are less good. And when and there was only one, but this re-performing mostly on one hour in Poderabilia because of the of the of the rights and and the and the kind of uh, the kind of the the restrictions that we can perform this piece longer can be only one hour and then the group is changing, but nobody really performs something long duration. And then there came two girls who want to re-perform House with Ocean View. House with Ocean View is 12, 12 days with no food except drinking water, living on the tree on the tree structures and sleeping during the night in the museum, very difficult piece to perform. But these two girls already re-performed my work for three years around. So they have all possibility, all charisma needed and preparation how to do that. So the one of the most, most uh, the, the kind of, um, how you say, the, the moment in my life that was incredibly emotional was when I came to Bonn Museum to see how Sudoshu first performed. And I didn't want to come first day or second day because I wanted to generate her own public, you know, and own support. So I came incognito, like, I don't know, fifth, seven, eight days. It was close to the end, very difficult. And I just went there and I stood in the front of the structure. That feeling that this work is not anymore in my hands. This, this work is really have its own life and nothing can happen to, to it because actually can be performed. And that woman had charisma, had everything it needs. It was one of the most touching moments in my life. So I think this is possible. It's not always it's going to be great, but there is a big possibility that actually work can have new life. So, so actually you do it by, uh, my question was, rather simplistic but you do it by having people who are trained who do it well and they're, they're the legacy of their performance is that other performers understand how it should be done but are you controlling it through the marina abramovich institute that you set up back in 2007 will that be in some ways the organization where re-performance has to be agreed and, and that they will stipulate the conditions that are necessary you know, right now, right now, I am really in this process of creating this entire system, how it's going to work. And I need the lawyers and I need lots of lots of uh, kind of um, help in this because it's my Abramovich LSC, which is my, you know, the place that my work and and uh, and have a, and uh, is sold. And there is also the completely not profit organization, which is mine. So the my right now got his own house just since two months, by the way. Well, you need to know it's it's old hotel in, in the in the little island, not in the island, but in the inside the mountain in Greece, two and a half hours from the from airport. With actually, we have sixteen rooms. We're going to continue our workshops in the house and the Abramovich method. We're going to train young performance artists and you know also facilitate their own work and also training for the for the re performance situation. But not just my work, we we perform generally for historical works too. And uh, so this is all happening now. I, I just right now been appointed to be the Pina Bausch professor. The Pina Bausch Cathedral just opened in Essen. And I just came from Essen just five days, like 26 students there. And it was, it was so interesting. What happened to Pina Bausch legacy? Because I need to have something that I can refer to, you know, to create my own. 
and the the the, the son of Pina Bausch, who now is running this legacy, you know, told me that Pina Bausch she was not feeling well, and she never went to the doctor. She went to the doctor to check. She had a absolutely you know cancer all over the body, and in three days never left the hospital and died. And she left everything total and mess. There is no legacy. There is no anything more to do. And he was a lawyer doing completely something else. So he, he left his his uh, his, his uh, uh, and become the director of this foundation. And now she's putting all this together. And I'm really hoping that he's going to help me, you know, also to kind of get my own structure there because it's very complete, complex. Now and all the people in a Bausch that the performer are all old and they are not performing anymore. So they have to pass new group, new group have to repeat the old pieces. It's very, it's very similar, you know, to, to my situation. And also the dancers are not just the normal dancers, it's incredible physical involvement. The, the pieces are very physical and we have to use training to do what. So I'm just, you know, really, and as I say, today, 76 is the best moment of having this conversation, <laughs> thinking I have to come very soon with the right solution. I've just got one final question for Marina. I want to let you go and celebrate your birthday um, properly. But Pina Bausch, it's an interesting parallel. So Pina Bausch's oeuvre as a choreographer and as a dancer, is it exists and um, companies can choose which one of all of that they, they want to re-perform. And there are obviously stipulations, but that's the, that, that's the deal. Um, in your oeuvre uh, going forward, will there be works that you won't allow people to re-perform. I mean, for example, Rest Energy that you and Ule did in 1980, which involved a bow and arrow, and you, I mean, literally, if his finger slips, you die. Um, will, you, will you say that certain works can't be re-performed, or, or will you leave it to, to, the, to the lawyers and the performers of the future to work out any one of your performances, if they want to re-perform it, that's up to them? Oh, I think there is certain performances that I, there's only me who is actually, you know, the, taking risk of his own life. And I don't want this risk to happen to anybody else. So definitely Rhythm Zero will be one out of the chart. And the definitely rhythm, the Rest Energy second one. And, and I don't think to other ones. You know, the, there is nobody ever asked to perform artists present. I wondered about that. 736 and a half hours, yes. All, the, nobody asked till three months ago. Three months ago, the, I got the letter. There is one girl who wanted to re-perform this piece. And I, and I was so, so surprised. The most interesting part of this, that this girl is Indian. And she thinks that she's able to do that. And I have a long conversation with her. And I'm definitely interested to train her and to give her all my knowledge to can do that. Because it's funny that that Indian person asked because so much techniques and so much of my learning is came actually for me being in India in retreats in all kinds of monasteries and doing the lots of lots of heart you know the 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 the, the for the body and mind exercises and became part of Abrahamic method so that this Indian one I'm very confident that actually she could do that so that would be incredible and it takes a little time to really do that and to do preparation but i'm very interested to train her and we are actually thinking of a possibility the opening new museum in delhi and if they wanted to show the entire documentation artist is present we maybe have her re-performing that would be amazing and it would be amazing for you to be one of the people who came to sit in front of the artist re-performing a Marina Abramovich piece, The Artist is Present, that was from 2010. Marina, it's time for your birthday uh, celebrations to begin. Thank you so much for doing this. Um, sorry about some technical glitches, but um, happy birthday from us all.